back to Italy at last. Welcome to the 1935 Copacciano by Johannes Lacroix. Welcome to another episode of Grand Prix 80th Anniversary. Today, it's the Copacciano. This race, this series, is a series where I review Grand Prix races that happened 80 years ago to the day. Yeah, this is representation of where everyone comes from. Yeah. Last week was what might be one of the greatest races of all time, the German Grand Prix, where Tatsuno Valari defeated the superior German cars on their home turf. There aren't many paintings of this event. You just It's hard to actually... And... But today we finally returned to Italy for a popular race, the Copacciano. Italian for Cyan Cup. That means... Alright. Whatever. This, the track we're on is monstrous. It runs along the shoreline and the mountains of the beautiful town of Montenero Livorno in Tuscany. It's the, it, it is a beautiful place to be. I mean, it's around, it's on the shoreline, and this is the actual circuit. It runs through a mountain as well. It's a great place to be. Or it's, it's scenic, but this will be the last time the race will be held on the Montenero Livorno circuit, as it was dangerous and unpopular. Much like the Bergamo circuit race in May, most racers are fending for themselves. However, we do have Scuderia Ferrari here today, with their... Alfa Romeo's supported to them by the company. In fact, once again, we have Ferrari racing in two locations here in Montenero and the Comenges, Comenges GP in Saint Gaudin. So, what we have here in the Copacciano are two people who participated in the German Grand Prix last week Antonio Brivio and Tatsu Nivellari, the winner, bravest racer ever. And we also got Rene Dreyfus, the one whom Antonio Brivio was in place for. And Carlo Felix Trossi, a secondary driver for Ferrari who drives in Italian events and such. In the Comenge GP, there was Louis Chiron and Gianfranco Camotti. Now, they lost that event, uh, but the loss was not innocent, especially since it was a privateer that beat them. Yes, Raymond Sommer and... Uh, Raymond Sommer and... Comte Raff had beaten both of them, and they... Had, and they were both driving private, unsupported Alfa Romeos. And you know what? It was hard beside, deciding between these two races. Comenges, Come, where a privateer Alfa Romeo defeats the manufacturer Alphas, or Chiano, where the Siena Barbieri duel continues. Remember from episode 1, 2, 1 and 2. We're going to have fun with this. I mean... There was the Cena Barbieri duel which lasted in episode 7, but I didn't actually show you that. It was in a different race in, in Torino. It was, an easy, it, it was an easy decision, with the Copacciano not ruining the ending, despite less detailed. Anyway, we've also got the Scuderia Subalpina Maseratis here today, with some rather different drivers, two of them being Eugenio Siena and Giovanni Rocco. So yes, Subalpina have the biggest engine of all the drivers in the field, so they might be in with a chance of winning. So our eyes will be kept on Siena today. And lastly, we have some yellow Maseratis out there. And if you've seen episodes 6, 7, or 8, then you know what that means. It's Scuderia Villa Padierna! Yay! Woohoo! And now for the starting order. In row now half of these drivers don't have pictures. In row one we've got Constantino Magistri, um, in, the Alfa, in these private-owned Monzas, and Cornaggio Medici from Bergamo. Um, double last name. It's not actually a na That's that's not his first name. It's the first name is just an initial. Don't know what it is. Then we have uh, Letterio Cucinotta, Cucinotta, and a Maserati 26M. And we have uh, Antonio Brivio, who, in essence, might have been the pole position driver, because he's the highest placed um, person who's being paid to race here. 
I'm assuring you, Nuvo, this race will be much easier from than last week. Yes. Brivia was the one who watched Nuvo Lowry do quite an amazing race last week. And in row two, you've got Luigi Sofietti, and, um, who doesn't have a picture, but he's driving this blue Maserati, and Hans Rusch, driving that same uh, white and red Alfa Romeo he had in Bergamo. He's, only his is a Maserati. Hans Rusch from the Nürburgring. He's actually a major character we'll be seeing sometimes. And then we have Giovanni Minozzi from the Bergamo race. And we're, more Italian racing. It's great, isn't it? And he's driving his privately owned Monza. Albert Schambolst in the Maserati 8 CM. And then in row three, we have Giovanni Rocco, um, also in the, in the Maserati 26. Only his is the Subalpina one. Maserati 26 does, doesn't have the best, uh, the highest engine, but doesn't have the biggest engine, but it, he'll, he'll, he'll try his hardest today. You've got Rene Brook in the Bugatti Type 51, evolution of the legendary Bugatti Type 35. Uh, and then we have Tatsuna Valari, the legend himself, here in row three with his Alfa Romeo. You know what, Antonio? I think this might be. Yeah. Let's see what happens, though. Luigi Page and the Alfa Romeo Monza, his privately owned. Then in row four, we have Pio Cristina in the legendary... And the Bugatti Type 51, Legendary Type 35, Evolution. And now we have three people saying things behind him. Got Rene Dreyfus. Tony, Nuvo, I missed it. What was it like? That's a reference to the fact that he did not participate in the German Grand Prix and that he wants to know what it was like. Here's this Alfa Romeo Tipo B. We have Ferdinando Barbieri. Yeah. Off to a good start. I'm ahead. Fernando Barbieri driving for the Maz for the for Jose de Villapadierna. Off to a good start. Yep, Barbieri is ahead. Now Barbieri has has defeated Siena twice, but Siena defeated Barbieri um, in the, the Torino circuit. And here we have Carlo Felix Trossi. I want to know what it was like too. Looks like these guys want to tune in on what happened in the German Grand Prix. Last but not least, we've got Eugenio Siena. I mean, we should keep our eyes on because he's got quite a big engine underneath the hood of his Maserati 6C34. Enjoy your cockiness. In reference to Eugenio Siena. In head. As it turns out, Brivio is correct. The German Grand Prix last week was very hard for Nuvolari, but he had the bravery. But this was much easier for him and the whole team so they could show their brilliance once again. So, there's the Ferrari team passing through. Is this out of our way and experienced? Oh, they're leaving the genius in behind. Last year, Nuvolari's Bugatti had to lose to Achille Varzi's Alfa Romeo. But here, he's in a class of his own. This is just practice for the Coppa Acerbo, isn't it? Or the Pescara circuit for you Formula One historians as he drives down the mountain road that that's involved in the Montenero Livorno circuit. Yes, he's dominating this event totally. All right. He had come far ahead of his teammates, Brivio and Trossi. In the Barbieri Siena duel halfway through the race, Barbieri had lost his engine, so Siena wins once again. Oh dear. Yep, Barbieri lost his engine. He's in the middle of the water somehow, but... Yep. And Eugenia Siena, who we have to keep a serious eye on, passes by. Ha! Ah, now it's equal! Yep. So now Gian Barbieri has won twice, and Siena has won twice, too. Siena was doing much better than Barbieri was. So well, in fact, that he managed to keep ahead of Rene Dreyfus. This will be awesome! He's got the biggest engine, so he's definitely within shouts. Uh, he's in fourth place, he's trying his hardest. Not so fast, Subalpina! Ferrari vs. Maserati, it's a rivalry we've always seen. And there's the halfway point leaderboard. Yes, Nuvolari 
in a class of his own because the only true challenge comes from Germany, as we saw last week. Then we have Antonio Brivio, 51 seconds behind, and Carlo Felix Trossi, that was almost 100 seconds behind, or CF Trossi. Yeah, the Ferrari team is dominating so far with this is the fifth Ferrari, fourth Ferrari behind it. We got uh, Eugenio Siena, who is still doing a great job, and uh, he is three minutes off, and Rene Dreyfus is 49 seconds off of him, so they are fighting for a position. While Giovanni Minozza, Minozzi and Constantino Magistri, in their private own Monza, Monzas are duking it out for sixth place. But then the inevitable happened. Sienna, in the car with the biggest engine, had a plug failure. No! Ah, crap! Yes, and then Dr Dreyfus whizzes by. That means Ferrari dominate once again. And with that, there isn't much else to talk about in this race. Tatsuna Valari and the entire Ferrari team have dominated the Coppa Ciano. Yes! Woo! Nuvolari being the leader, and then there are his three his three sidekicks there with him as Nuvolari crosses the line with with all of them. It wasn't just the Ferrari part of Alfa Romeo that did so well. Behind the dominant Ferrari Alfa, behind the dominant Ferrari owned Alphas, came a private owned Monza driven by Constantino Magistri. Well, this was a good race, wasn't it? Yes. He was much further behind, probably about a lap, but... Oh, well. Behind him came Albert Schumbles, the highest placed non alfa Romeo result of the field. Okay, so now let's jump to conclusions. If you're a paid racing driver, it's 100% certain that you'll finish ahead of the inexperienced privateers. Unless you're Raymond Sommer. And so, if you drive for Ferrari, you will get 1,000 Lira because euros haven't been invented yet and this is what a thousand lira looks like you get one thousand lira bill because this is italian money before euros have been invented and no re you get no reward if you're just driving your own little monza that you've bought from a factory so with that aside here are the race results for this from this event so yes the scuderia, scuderia ferrari team dominated the race Nothing wrong with them at all. Antonio Brivio was two minutes off of the invincible Tatsuya Nuvolari. Um, this, with big things comes little things, yes. With little little things comes big things. Then we have Aunt Carlo Felix Trossi. In this, yes, it looks like all the Italian Ferrari drivers have defeated the, the only French one. Six minutes off, definitely. Not the best. We have Rene Dreyfus, about 45 seconds off of Trossi. They were definitely doing a good job in the Ferrari team. And then, behind all the Ferraris were a few private entries. It's kind of funny, isn't it? Anyway, Constantino Magistri, in this private entry, was a lap down. Then we have Albert Chambos, no, no photo, and his private-owned Maserati 8C, 8CM. One lap down, and Giovanni Minazzi fell two laps behind in his private-owned Monza. Uh, and Letterino, Letterio Cucignolta, the private-owned Maserati 26, two laps off. Wasn't very good, but... Then we have Luigi Sofietti in the private-entered private, private -entered blue Maserati, two laps off. And then the DNFs, obviously the most... High profile crash crashes were Eugenio Siena and Ferdinando Barbieri, but Siena did go quite far and was very high up the field. Barbieri was sixth, I think. He crashed, and then Luigi Paz and Coraggio Medici, their private owned Mansas. Don't know why they were, they fell out of the race, but they did. We have Hans Rusch and his private owned special Maserati, the gearbox failure. Is Nan Nando Ferdinando Barbieri in the team Villa Padierna had an engine failure. It wasn't wasn't particularly good for him, but he was sixth ahead of all the other privateers when he 
when he crashed. Um, we have poor Bugatti Type 51s. I mean, the Bugatti 30, Type 35 is legendary for revolutionizing Grand Prix racing, but unfortunately, they have lost their their success. The Type 51 is the final evolution of the Type 35, and it's already both of both of them entered have finished last, with Pio Cristina having a crash and Rene Bruck having a mechanical problem. Thank you for watching this episode of GP 80th Anniversary. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, click the like button or the subscribe button, or leave a comment. I'll see you in 11 days for one of the major races of 1935, the Copa Acerbo at the, at the legendary Pescara circuit.